In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. In this second part of tonight's session, we are to tackle two or three particular difficulties that could become a real obstacle in the journey of faith for some people. What we try to get from this is to have a clear, a clear view of what could oppose faith. St. Thomas Aquinas has a very important affirmation on this. He says, faith cannot be produced by mere reasoning. It is not arguments, it is not reasons that could bring us to faith. But reason is very important mainly to avoid those difficulties that could prevent us from accepting the message of faith. Take, for example, the idea so many people have nowadays that science is more than enough for addressing every human difficulty in the sense that we mentioned yesterday. Science becomes the supreme judge when it comes to truth. What is true about human beings, what is true about human history, what is true about the universe, what is true about feelings and emotions, and education, everything has to go through the filter of science. And science becomes so omnipresent, science becomes so relevant to the extent that some people could think we need nothing else. That's enough. This is at least the temptation some people have especially when they are doing some studies, say, in college or university. Also, yesterday we were mentioning the regretful fact that many people, when they go through college or they go through university, they think that they can drop faith because it is no longer necessary. And they probably come to think of faith as an unnecessary aid, unnecessary. I no longer need that thing. It is, it is told that a great French mathematician of the 19th century, Laplace, was presenting before Napoleon his system um, of the movement of celestial bodies according to the laws of Isaac Newton. So he presented the mathematical model and um, was really extending the idea to explain everything in the universe. And then Napoleon asked him, and what about God? And Laplace says, said, I didn't need that hypothesis. Is no longer necessary. I didn't need it. 
I didn't need that hypothesis. And that's the arrogant attitude that many people, not because they know science, but because they believe that science could address every human issue and could solve every human problem, that's the attitude they have. So we need some response to that. And again, it is not proving faith, it is about defending faith. It is showing that faith is not incompatible with real science and true science. Is it science, <clears throat> is it science the only judge or the supreme judge of truth? Well, it goes down to the, to language, really. What are the limits of language and what kind of language we can expect from science? Because we are not against science. Some people present things in terms of camps. The camp of believers and the camp of reasonable people. So that if you want to be, belong to the camp of believers, you have to deny science because you are so completely blindfolded that it is only it is only what you are told in the church that you believe that you accept so you are against reasonable knowledge you are against reason you are against science that's not the catholic perspective on this by all means we have to avoid the idea that accepting faith means rejecting science or accepting science means rejecting faith. That's not the Catholic position. What we believe is that science is a great gift and science is a marvelous and noble activity of humankind. And there's a lot that we can expect from science, but not everything can be expected from science. Why is it so? What are the limits of its language? That's what we are asking at this time. What are its limits? Well, we see, for a starter, we see that science is all about controlling circumstances. The lab, laboratory, the lab, that's the preferred place, that's the archetypical place for making science. Controlled circumstances, controlled so that everything that comes to the lab has its place and can be connected to some theory. Well, the next question is, is everything in human life controlled in the same way? Can we really separate, isolate, and control circumstances so as to define exactly what enters into the lab and what are the reactions or the results from the experiment. So many things cannot be controlled that way. And in that sense, we know that science being as noble and as powerful in obtaining great achievements, science is not everything, because there are many things that cannot be controlled in that way. To be even more precise, let's ask about meaning. Meaning. In the first part of today's session, we mentioned the fact that many people, many people, begin the journey of faith because they ask themselves about meaning. What's the meaning of all this? What's the meaning of my effort? What else can I expect from life? Take that kind of question and try to bring that question to the lab. 
take that kind of question and try to control every input, every circumstance, so as to get a scientific answer to that, you immediately realize that factors entering into that kind of question are simply countless. You cannot limit everything that could bring meaning to your life. Even more so, you realize that science was built to establish what is going on, and that means facts. Science is interested and is very good at getting facts right. But facts could have very different meanings for, very, for different people. I can know that a knife is able to kill a person, for example, if severing a, an artery or a vein, and that person could die from that. But is that good? Is that evil? Nature is of no help on this regard because we say that new life and new killing happens all the time in the natural world. We see the lion killing the zebra. Is that good? Is that bad? We can only establish that with the proper speed and with the proper strategy, the lion will be able to kill the zebra. That's all we know. Is that good? Probably it's good for the lion, it's bad for the zebra. That's everything that we can say in that case. But we can't establish, really. So facts are very important, and dealing with facts and building evidence from facts and using results from facts in order to build up technology, that's all very good. And that's, and that's so efficient that we can build microphones and lamps and spaceships and smartphones and cars and computers. Yes. But what kind of use we make with those computers, with those spaceships, with those tools, that's not part of science. That belongs to a different realm, and that's the realm of meaning. What will I make? What will I do with this? That's not an answer that I can get from facts. Facts tell me what will be the result but is that result meaningful? Is that result useful? Is that result convenient? It is, is it good? We don't know. We cannot get an answer from science. Science, and this is a very powerful assertion, science is not able to build ethics. Ethics cannot be built on science alone. Because science simply establishes facts. And facts can be seen from many different perspectives and can be good for some people and can be bad for other people. And there's something, there's something interesting about this. Because some countries have taken scientific results to establish harsh policies, for example, regarding human population, human uh, po growth, population growth, and I suppose the most visible case would be China. Another important case would be Japan. Situation in Japan is serious. It's really serious. Because some very clever people, some very smart people decided that it was not good for Japan to have so many children. And they began to spread the message that not having children or having 
a maximum of one child would be more than enough for most couples and that they had to limit themselves in such a way as to stop growth of population, of human population, by all means. We can say that they were, they were almost too successful. When we think of Tokyo, when we think of Japan, we think of an overcrowded place. But the mathematics is telling a different story. The mathematics is telling the story of a very elderly and growing elderly population and a narrower and narrower and narrower basis that will have to support all that elderly population. And if you do the math, some people have already done it, if you do the math, you realize that there's no possibility for that to work. Some people, I'm not making up this, of course. You can look for this on the internet, for example. Some people speak of the extinction of the Japanese population. Oh, that looks completely, completely overstated. That cannot happen. Well, that was also what I thought until I saw the curves and the population. It seems that Japan already reached their peak in human population and what comes next is decline and decline and decline. A similar story we can find in China. We can see in China. China thought that it wasn't good to have so many children. That was one problem. And another problem was it was important to stop, to stop birth rate of female children. No more women. Situation has become really complicated. Some three or four years ago, I had the opportunity of going to Taiwan and to Macau and to Hong Kong and other places in the Far East. And you, you have to be there to listen to some really, really preoccupating stories. For example, there's human trafficking. Countries like Vietnam are selling people. And you guess it, people that they are selling are mainly Women, all those women that were killed by abortion in China, all those women that were not allowed to be born, now those women are required, are needed. In some towns in China, the complete imbalance, the total imbalance of male and female population have become unbearable the situation. What do you make of a town where you have three men by every single woman? What do you make of that? What's the future of that? Now, the problem is... <laughs> problem is that... Or the interesting fact is that people that were behind those harsh policies in Japan and in China were using scientific reasoning. They were very, very thoughtful people, very clever people, very intelligent people, and they were thinking of the best way to, to plan the future of their countries using what they thought was established science. Again, I'm not against science. It is the arrogance. It is the thinking that science alone can tell the whole truth about every human affair. 
It is not that way. And the sooner we learn that, the better for humankind. Sometimes, and this would be, will be my last example, sometimes people think that dressing their thoughts in science, they will become swallowable, will become acceptable, and people will swallow that. A really tragic example of this was a man, he was a cleric for the Angli uh, from the Anglicans in England, Malthus, M-A-L-T-H-U-S. Malthus was the first one, at least with some prominence, that affirmed that human population was a real menace for the future of the world and the future of humankind. And he dressed, he dressed up his thinking with some science, fake science, bad science, poor science, but science. What he said was that human population grows up according to geometric progression, geometric series, and resources from nature grow according to arithmetic progression, arithmetic series. So we need a little of math for this. An arithmetic progression or arithmetic series is a series of numbers, as the name indicate, a series of numbers that keep growing at a steady rate. For example, you have three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen. That would be arithmetic serious arithmetic progression. You keep a constant number that is added to each new member to obtain the next member of the series, and you can continue forever, of course. So Malthus said that resources for nature, from nature, grow up only as an arithmetic progression like 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, etc. And what about human population? He said that it was geometric progression. What is a geometric series? It is a series of numbers that grow according to some factor, some factor that gets multiplied by each member to obtain the next number. Think, for example, of this series. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. You see that geometric progression goes really quick. It is not the quickest of all series, but it goes quick. And at any rate, it goes far quicker than the arithmetic progression. Arithmetic progression goes this way, like a slope, a gentle slope. Geometric progression goes up, up to the sky. As I said, with the series 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, and so on. So Malthus said that human population grows up according to geometric progression and natural resources grow according to arithmetic progression. Obviously, there's no possibility of natural resources catching up with human population's growth. Well, it is... It is a powerful idea. And once you hear this, you really, really become concerned. And you probably say, you probably say, we have to do something. We have to stop birth rate 
by any possible means. This has been done in many countries. You and I know of countries like India and some parts of Latin America where a very harsh, a very rude, a very abusive method was used. And that was operating men and women so as to, so as to become, as transform them into barren people, to sterilize people so that they can no longer have children. This has been applied to many people in India and in other places. Okay, but what about the reasoning that Malthus was using? Is there, and this is almost laughable, is there any scientific evidence that human population left to its own resources? Human population goes in geometric proportion? No. Is there any evidence that Resources from nature go according to arithmetic progression? No. He simply, Malthus, simply made up that. He made up those figures. He proposed that with a very powerful visual mathematical model with no backing, with no support, with no real foundation. But it was solved that way. And once you have heard human population, geometric progression, natural resources, arithmetic progression, and then you remember the two curves, there's no way of catching up. This is about to enter into huge crisis. Something has to be done. It was a huge, it was a horrible, it was a terrible lie. There's no scientific evidence for that. So it is not that we have become enemies against science. We admire science. We need science. We think high of science. But we know that science is not everything. And we know that in order to build ethical codes, in order to discover what is really good and what might be evil, what might be wrong, what might be bad, we need far more than science. The good for the human heart cannot be deduced just from facts. And that's the reason we need something else and that something else, that kind of goodness, that kind of discovery of what is good goes far beyond that establishing some facts. Next question. Is it not the case that more religion means more fanaticism and fundamentalism? In the great debate about evolution and creation and in the debate about science and religion many people present things in a very simplistic way if you are a believer you're a fanatic you are unable you have been crippled your mind is crippled and you are not able to think with logic again we have to repeat this several times. The problem is not with the logic. The problem is not, is not at all with the possibility of following an argument or presenting an argument. But we have to confess, if we are believers, we have to confess that something could be done and something should be done about our own intellectual formation. We need more people. We need more convinced and prayerful and loving and caring Christians and Catholics in the lab. We need more 
Christians and Catholics in Congress very coherent in their faith. We need more Catholics in the office of lawyers and barristers. We need more Catholics working in deep and profound search of those truths that will shape the future of our society. We need Catholics there. We cannot say simply that there's no conflict between science and faith and then rest assured that nothing will happen with our faith. We need people working there in the front of the battle. We need people making a clear stance that there's no conflict, but showing that, not in the easy case, that probably is what we have here. We are all in the church, so it's not that difficult to say what I am saying. Well, the hard work is now for you. I say this in the church, and it is not that difficult for me, but I need you to work that talking face to face to the agnostics, to atheists, and those who even mock at religion. So fanaticism and fundamentalism are not a real possibility for a true Christian, but we need to prove that in the battlefield. And we need more people engaged in this kind of discussion. Which is why... I would love to have more young people in this kind of reflection, in this kind of retreat. If we had more people, more young people in this kind of talk, probably they could realize that there's something that Jesus is asking from them if they are willing to answer to his call. Our final question for tonight... Is it possible to be a true Christian and at the same time to enjoy this present life? It's a good question. Also a question that is easily presented by young people. It is of our, it is of our interest to take very seriously these kind of questions because some people could avoid faith because of the moral requirements that faith brings with itself. What can we say about this? Well, without some philosophy, without some reflection about what is good in human life, it's not easy to give an answer to this, to this kind of question. If you imagine that human life should be all about being glad and enjoying yourself and having picnic, as they say. If you think that human life is picnic, every effort, every sacrifice, every renouncement will be unbearable to you. But that idea of human life is simply not correct. So... Before, before we make the question, and I repeat the question, is it possible to be a true Christian and at the same time to enjoy this present life? Before we make that question, we have to get some clarity, some light about what human life is all about. Only when we realize what's the What's the beauty and what's the fruit and what's the meaning of human life? We are able to ask the proper question. And the proper question is not, what should I do in order to enjoy to the maximum my life? But the question is, given the fact that human life is called to be meaningful, given the fact that human life is called to be fruitful, What's the best possible way to get to that goal? Unless we think in terms 
of fruitfulness and in terms of meaning unless we think on these terms there's no possibility of addressing with some profit the kind of question that we have at the end of this talk. Once, once we recognize that the best possible human life is that which is fruitful and that is truly meaningful, once we establish that, we begin to ask what's the best way to get to that point and then we see the example of Christ we see the example of many coherent and very virtuous Christians and we call them some of them saints when I see what saints have done when I see what they have put in order, had, had invested in order to get that goal, I find it makes a lot of sense to do that. I see what they have done and I realize it makes sense. Recently, I was thinking of John Henry Newman who was beatified by Pope Benedict XVI not long ago, three or four years maybe. John Henry Newman, he had a good life. He was a member of the clergy and the Anglican Communion. He was a founder and a direct director of the Oxford Movement and that was the beginning of his journey in the sense that the Oxford movement was concerned about very deep questions on Christianity. Questions of this sort. What we believe as Anglicans, this was in the 19th century, and he was an Anglican, I said. So the Oxford movement had this kind of question. What we practice and what we believe as Anglicans in the 19th century, corresponds, corresponds to what Christians believed in the early centuries of Christianity? That's a difficult question. That's a way of transforming to your life from a very comfortable one to a very complicated one. So he complicated his life, if you like. Because making this kind of question, posing this kind of question, complicates your life. So he complicated his life. But he complicated his life because he understood that only truth, only what is really the truth, could fulfill his deep desire and his deep desire, his profound thirst had to be quenched. And the only possible way of quenching his thirst was searching and searching and searching. Eventually, he came to a horrible conclusion. I have to give up everything, almost everything that I have believed so far. So, at some point, he had to stand in front of his congregation and to tell the people, I can no longer continue this way. I have to make some deep changes in my life. Sorry about that, but I will no longer serve you as a member of the clergy in the Anglican Communion. And he bad farewell to his congregation and he went to a long spiritual retreat and eventually from that retreat he came to the conclusion that he should move towards Catholic faith, towards Catholicism. It was a journey with a lot of struggling. It was a journey with a lot of suffering. It was a journey with 
agonizing, agonizing questions. And we could say, well, that's a lot of suffering. Yes, it was. That's a lot of struggling. Yes, it was. Was it meaningful? Was it worthy the pain? Yes, it was. For John Henry Newman, it was. So it is only when we raise the standard of human life, when we raise the standard of what is human life all about, it is only then that we come to understand that Christianity is a meaningful proposal, and at least for some of us, the best possible proposal. Let us finish, my friends, with the biblical text as we did yesterday. This time, text is taken from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians, chapter 3. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of this, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now, you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its Creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, 